Good morning everyone. In the previous class we have talked about the normal appearance of salivary glands and the function of saliva within the human body. In today's session we will be talking about the salivary glands disorders affecting uh, one or uh, all the base of the salivary glands and the imaging which is done to produce a, a reproducible picture of the salivary gland disorders and which can enable us to understand the normal functioning as well as uh, the non-functioning of these salivary glands during a, a particular disease. So within these uh, disorders, it's basically classified as uh, the first uh, group uh, is uh, called as developmental disorders within which we have the, uh, these are the list of uh, commonly occurring developmental disorders which might uh, which appear uh, during the birth, during birth or it, which might arise uh, into prominence during the pubertal, uh, pubertal time. So uh, apart from developmental disorders, we also have functional disorders wherein the development of all the salivary glands are uh, to the normal uh, uh, likings or to the normal uh, appearance of the salivary glands. But the functioning of uh, these particular uh, salivary glands are somewhat disturbed under which we uh, predominantly have salivaria or xerostomia. The functioning of saliva can, uh, if, uh, it has to be either uh, deficient in uh, quantity or uh, quality or more in uh, quantity or quality and that is uh, pr uh, predominantly salivaria or xerostomia respectively. Apart from this we also have obstructive disorders wherein the development of uh, salivary glands are fine, the function of uh, salivary glands are fine but because of secondary uh, etiologies or uh, uh, etiologies which might arise from within the salivary glands itself, there might be obstruction of the production of saliva within, uh, so, uh, thereby resulting in final xerostomia, which is because not because of the inherent uh, disorder of the salivary glands, but because of a secondary etiology or a secondary factor due to which there is uh, obstruction in the normal uh, functioning of salivary glands and production of saliva. Apart from this, we also have a separate uh, class of uh, diseases uh, classified under as cysts uh, in which we have mucosils and ranulas and also we have asymptomatic enlargement wherein we do not uh, have any particular symptoms associated with the enlargement of salivary glands, uh, either hypertrophy or hyperplasia of salivary glands, but this is totally asymptomatic under which we have allergic or sialosis or something or enlargements which is uh, related to malnutrition or sometimes even habitual. We then have infectious kind of uh, uh, salivary gland disorders within which we are all bacterial as well as uh, viral or fungal are uh, involved in uh, di uh, causing diseases to the salivary glands and also we have autoimmune disorders wherein there is a dysregulation of the immunity system and the body uh, recognizes these salivary glands as not of its own but something alien. So within the developmental abnormalities, first we have the aberrant uh, salivary glands which is nothing but the name itself suggests that the, these particular salivary glands are not normally found in that particular location but these are not uh, localized to that particular location but still are found in uh, regions such as your cervical uh, uh, region near the parotid uh, gland or the body of the mandible or sometimes even the lips wherein uh, these salivary glands, be it the major or the minor salivary glands are not normally found but in, the, uh, in such a development disorder they are found in a, a whatever may be the size, be it big or uh, the minor salivary glands they are not normally found in that particular region. So a simple uh, kind of a developmental disorder, the other one being aplasia or hyperplasia, aplasia uh, name suggests there is no development of salivary gland itself or uh, hypoplasia wherein the, the salivary gland is uh, smaller than its normal size. Uh, that would be the uh, aplasia or hypoplasia since the, uh, uh, the quantity of the or the size of the salivary gland itself is uh, coming down or it is not up to the normal uh, standards. The amount of saliva which is uh, secreted out is also uh, less in quantity thereby uh, leading to xerostomia or dryness of mouth and its subsequent uh, sequel is like a early loss of teeth or a rampant caries or a dried mouth or, or presence of opportunistic infections like fungal infections. All these sequelae of a xerostomia follow up uh, with aplasia or hypoplasia. In such type of uh, patients we normally uh, uh, suggest the uh, patients to maintain good oral hygiene 
and to also use uh, in severe cases salivary substitutes. Then we have, if we have something called as hypoplasia, there's always something called as hyperplasia wherein it is bigger than the normal size, wherein the quantity of saliva is uh, much more uh, than the normal uh, person. Now, uh, be it less or be it more, the, uh, uh, anything excess uh, or a deficient will cause some problem. In these cases also, because of excessive uh, production of saliva, there is drooling of saliva from the corners of the mouth. And because of the stagnancy of uh, saliva in, in the corners of the mouth, there is a uh, occurrence or high uh, predominance uh, of occurrence of uh, angular colitis, uh, primarily because of stagnation of uh, saliva in the corners of the mouth. They were also, uh, it might lead to uh, fungal infections, again predominantly in the uh, corners of the mouth. Now, uh, it, it uh, will cause some aesthetic problems, uh, aesthetic uh, uh, problems to the patient also. So in these uh, kind of uh, cases, normally the patient goes for a surgical excision when it becomes uh, too problematic or too symptomatic. Uh, an excision of the uh, salivary gland, the effective salivary gland, uh, will cause a, will uh, result in a permanent solution to, in uh, such cases. Now there's something called as atresia. Now atresia is something called uh, a congenital occlusion of salivary glands. Now uh, be it the, uh, the two different pairs of salivary glands, when there's a uh, joining of these two uh, salivary glands and uh, uh, appearance of a single salivary gland, not only uh, there is a decrease in the quantity of saliva, there is also a decrease in the quality of saliva because of occlusion of two ty uh, different types of uh, salivary glands. Now that also uh, will lead to severe xerostomia, uh, as I said, because of the decrease in the quantity of saliva. Most pro common and, uh, common site is the uh, submandibular duct in the floor of the mouth, wherein there is uh, uh, the sublingual and the submandibular glands occlude together uh, forming a single salivary gland. Now there's something called as functional disorders. As told, there's uh, either decrease in the quantity of saliva or uh, that there might be increase in the quantity of saliva. The increase is called tylism or salaria. As I said, because of the increase in the saliva, there's pooling of saliva in the uh, uh, corners of the mouth. They're drooling. Because of that, uh, we have a uh, unesthetic appearance of uh, appearance of uh, high predominance of uh, uh, opportunistic infections in the corner of the mouth or angular colitis, all these are uh, related uh, sequelae which are related to salaria. Now this salaria could be uh, inherent uh, from the uh, uh, for, by the salivary gland wherein in originally during the development itself it could be uh, because of the large uh, uh, hyperplasia or hypertrophy of salivary glands or it could be induced like in uh, drugs like salogox wherein uh, it increases the salivary production temporarily and also local factors like anugor, erythema, multiform where is, wherein there is increased uh, salivation and also uh, during uh, metal poisoning uh, predominantly lead or uh, bismuth or arsenic metal poisoning there is an increase in the salivary production uh, so that uh, gives rise to the uh, sequelae of uh, increased uh, salivary productions. Now, as I said, these are the clinical features and also the management. Since uh, if uh, the person is under uh, induced salaria, such as uh, because of drugs like uh, salagox, now the antagonists of uh, these uh, drugs could be given, like anticholinergic drugs, predominantly atropine sulfate. Uh, that could uh, that. Uh, antagonist is the action of these uh, salagogic drugs thereby decreasing the quantity of saliva or if the person needs a permanent solution there is always a solution of a scalpel and a scalpel excision uh, and a total reduction in the quantity of the salivary gland. Uh, the other side of the spectrum there is xerostomia instead of excessive salivation or excessive production of saliva there is absolute deficiency of a salivary production both at uh, uh, induced states as well as normal states or resting states. Now the etiology could be radiation induced or drug induced. Drug, drug induced, as I said, uh, could be because of excessive use of usage of anticholinergic drugs like atropine, or it could be radiation induced, wherein there is micro damage to the uh, salivary ducts as such because of the secondary effects of radiation induced uh, radiation uh, effects on the soft tissues. Thereby there is uh, closure of the uh, strictures or strictures formation of 
or a decrease in the diameter of the salivary glands, they were reduction, a permanent reduction in the uh, quantity of the saliva. So, as I said, the clinical features, again, the, all the sequelae of a xerostomia, be it the dryness of the mouth or the, be it the uh, uh, production or predominance of uh, opportunistic infections, or rampant caries because of uh, insufficient flushing, act, flushing action of uh, the saliva, or the burning sensation itself uh, because of lack of lubricancy within the oral uh, mucosa and the tongue itself. So all these sequelae follow uh, xerostomia. The management, obviously, it should be the, uh, uh, if it is a drug-induced uh, xerostomia, obviously the antagonist, that is uh, your silagogs, will help increase in the salivary production. Or it, if it is uh, to a minor extent, then we can always use uh, conservative methods like uh, taking in uh, lemon water or citrus fruits, increase in the quantity of uh, citrus fruits that could uh, lead to salivary stimulation. They were stimulating the salivary glands to uh, produce extra amount of saliva in the mouth or usage of salivary stimulants or artificial uh, saliva, uh, salivary uh, stimulants that could artificially moisten your uh, mouth or uh, replace the uh, reduced amount of saliva. All these are conservative methods and also we have uh, uh, not so conservative surgical methods uh, like a, a total uh, uh, like uh, decrease uh, or increasing uh, the salivary production, uh, usage of accessory salivary glands or, uh, a decrease, or uh, systemic salivary stimulation by giving uh, anti uh, uh, medications like uh, uh, anticholinergics like bromexine which will increase the quantity as well as the quantity of uh, saliva by uh, activating the cells of salivary glands or the parenchymic cells of the salivary glands predominantly the parotid glands, they were increasing the production of uh, saliva. Now there are also obstructive disorders wherein uh, the development as well as the function are all uh, uh, normal but because of an uh, external or an internal factor there is total obstruction of the ducts of the salivary glands or uh, obstruction of the uh, parenchymal cells to produce uh, saliva itself, they were reduction in the saliva uh, as a final result. Now that is uh, the most important one would be your silurethesis that is salivary gland stones or formation of calculus within the salivary gland ducts that is nothing but that would be a uh, lodgement of a food particle or increase in the amount of uh, thickness of saliva or ropey saliva wherein the increase in the mineral content of the saliva there is a formation of a nidus around which the subsequent layers of uh, mineral deposits occurs and thereby it forms a calculus within the salivary gland ducts. Now that is called the uh, salivary gland calculus which uh, eventually uh, totally obstructs the production of saliva. <clears throat> so the clinical features, uh, there would be severe pain and swelling during meals. The obvious reason uh, being this particular calculus or during meals there is an increased production of saliva. So the increased production of saliva, there is increased amount of quantity of saliva pushing against the calculus or the obstruction within the duct, there were increased pressure within the limited areas of the ducts occurs, thereby increasing the pain or uh, transient swelling, especially before meals, that are uh, typical symptoms of uh, the silolithiasis. Now, this if uh, this particular calculus gets uh, secondarily infected, there, would, uh, there could also be production of uh, pus, uh, exudation of pus from the salivary duct orifices. Now, radiographically, it is, uh, since it is a mineral deposit or calcium deposit, it is totally uh, radio-opaque, uh, oval shape or uh, circular shape, and with uh, we can see concentric layers of radio-opaque layers, which, would, uh, li uh, which uh, sh uh, tells us about the formation of this particular calculus. Now, these are the clinical pictures, as you can see, the hard mass and the floor of the mouth, especially the submandibular gland, now uh, you can see the calculus over there. Now the most commonly affected uh, gland also is the submandibular gland, primarily uh, because it produces thick or uh, mucus uh, kind of uh, saliva, wherein the mucus content is more, the flow is uh, less, thereby the formation of calculus, the chances of formation of the calculus within the submandibular uh, gland ducts uh, is on the higher side. Now there's something called a cyst of uh, salivary glands, 
it could be uh, developmental or induced like traumatic uh, there is uh, basically what happens over here is because of developmental uh, issues or because of trauma induced during the development there is uh, a total a damage of the ducts of the minor salivary glands now since the ducts are totally ruptured the saliva uh, pulls out or extravasates out into the external interstitial tissue they were causing a pooling of a saliva and they were uh, leading to a such kind of cysts of, uh, uh, of salivary gland uh, etiology. Uh, the two types in this, the extravasation cyst or the mucus retention cyst, as, as I said, because of the damage to the uh, uh, sal minus, minus salivary gland ducts, there could be a pooling or extravasation of saliva to the, into the interstitial tissues or because of minor obstructions of the minor salivary glands ducts itself there could be total obstruction of such a, a minor, minor salivary gland duct orifices thereby uh, causing a retention kind of cyst now the clinical features as i said uh, it is predominantly asymptomatic now uh, but sometimes it could be uh, related with uh, uh, symptoms of pain uh, which are frequently recurrent, that is to say, the, uh, during the pr uh, process of extravasation of saliva, there would be a formation of the cyst. Now, the, gradually, the cyst, uh, the saliva gets drained out from that particular area, so the saliva, uh, the swelling subsides. Now, again, uh, there would be extravasation of saliva, again, it would be totally recurrent. So, this is a recurrent uh, type of swelling uh, occurring at regular intervals. The management, uh, it could uh, we could easily uh, go under the scalpel excision methods to totally uh, remove that particular injured uh, salivary gland duct orifices or the ducts, or excision of the or uh, drainage of the saliva from that particular area, or if it is aesthetically not pleasing, we can also go for conservative or a less uh, invasive methods like cryosurgery or uh, CO2 uh, lasers, which would. Uh, uh, which are more aesthetically pleasing. Now, ranula is nothing but a mucosal which occurs in the floor of the mouth. Now, the basic uh, why it has been differentiated is uh, primarily because of its uh, clinical appearance. Now, ranula is nothing but a uh, uh, name uh, derived from the rana tigrina, that is the frog's underbelly, which is more, uh, which is all uh, its bluish in uh, color. Now, a similar appearance is a ranula which occurs in the floor of the mouth, which is bluish in color because of the superficial uh, product, uh, extravasation, superficial swelling uh, occurring because of the extravasated saliva. Now this uh, could be superficial or plunging deep within the spaces. Now sight as I said more uh, commonly occurs in the floor of the mouth and uh, it is a unilateral bluish swelling. Now the management is similar to a mucosal, uh, surgical ex uh, excisions or uh, mass polarizations or uh, laser treatments, laser ablations or cryosurgeries. Now the infectious kind of uh, salivary gland disorders, the most important or the most common kind uh, which e each and every individual undergoes is the viral infections among which mumps, which you know it is uh, nothing but a bilateral uh, uh, unit, uh, bilateral swelling of the submandibular or the parotid glands, predominantly the parotid swellings. It is, uh, yes it is uh, symptomatic, uh, it could be unilateral or uh, bilateral and since it is a viral infection, it is always associated with uh, symptoms like uh, fever, malaise or anorexia. It is very tender on a, a palpation. Uh, now it is, it would be naturally uh, regressive. The uh, viral infection runs through its uh, course from 14 days to 21 days and then gradually regresses. Now it can always be prevent, uh, prevented by giving MMR vaccines and uh, since it is a self-limiting uh, uh, disease only symptomatic uh, uh, F relief to the patient is enough. Now there's uh, bacterial infections on the other hand uh, uh, predominantly because of the uh, uh, high percentage of uh, staphylis aureus or staphylis uh, uh, viridans, uh, a percentage of occurrence of these bacteria within the oral mouth. Now, any uh, in, uh, compromised patients or medically compromised patients or patients with bad oral hygiene, now these uh, particular bacteria can cause uh, inflammation, a retrograde kind of inflammation or infection of the salivary glands through the salivary gland orifices. Uh, as I said, uh, since uh, in any kind of inflammation, the common uh, features of pain, fever, 
reddishness, elevation of the ear lobule primarily uh, because it uh, affects mostly the parotid gland and the parotid gland on uh, expansion or on swelling it raises the ear lower uh, ear lobe so that is a typical feature of uh, bacterial infections now management uh, would be the standard uh, management uh, of antibiotics and symptomatic treatment now in cases of immune dysregulation wherein the body does not recognize the salivary glands as its own but but as, as an alien now uh, these are these are the cases of autoimmune disorders the primary being the Jogren's uh, syndrome the most important being Jogren's syndrome which is a uh, uh, nothing but an autoimmune disease an uh, inflammatory autoimmune disease which affects the salivary glands the lacrimal glands and other exocrine glands so all these uh, it is a, a basically a syndrome which affects one or more systems now the primary uh, type of uh, Jogren's syndrome it affects the uh, eyes as well as the mouth and uh, so uh, uh, there is conjunctivitis as well as xerostomia now in secondary along with these there is also involvement of other collagen autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or SLEs so that would be uh, your Jogren's syndrome now the clinical features since it is uh, the primary feature of uh, Jogren's syndrome in the uh, when related to the oral mucosa is xerostomia and as we have talked about xerostomia the, all the features uh, related to all the, all the sequelae which follows up with uh, xerostomia are seen in a severe case on a severe uh, scale in uh, and Jogren's uh, patient and uh, this uh, on radiographic uh, findings since there is destruction of the parenchymal cells of the Jogren's syndrome because of this uh, autoimmune uh, infection inflammations now there would be a snowstorm appearance or in uh, some cases called cherry blossom appearance that is to say on taking this uh, uh, radioisotope imaging uh, we can see uh, the uh, accumulation of uh, this uh, radioisotope contrast within the areas wherein there is destruction of the parenchymal cells so on uh, effectively when we uh, take a uh, radiograph there's uh, we can see small blossoms or small dots of uh, radio opaque uh, contrast uh, medium accumulated within the areas of destruction of parenchymal cells which gives a typical appearance of a cherry blossom appearance or a snowstorm appearance now the management obviously symptomatic treatment for the xerostomia patients as well as surgery for enlargement of uh, uh, glands would be the standard treatment of uh, Jogren's syndrome. Now the investigations uh, beat in any kind of uh, salivary gland disorders it goes through a non-invasive and an invasive investigations in an, uh, in an order the non-invasive obviously you are a standard uh, chair side investigations followed by extra investigations which I have uh, uh, talked about in salivary gland imaging then there is computerized uh, tomography also and our uh, computerized CT is a 3D imaging uh, 3D representation of the salivary glands and there is also ultrasound uh, scanning uh, using sound waves now the invasive investigations uh, predominantly it would be uh, uh, primarily your biopsy uh, or the uh, fine needle aspiration cytology both of which will give a uh, fine FNIC gives a uh, estimation of the uh, liquid or a uh, uh, liquid kind of uh, swellings or a uh, cyst to analyze uh, the internal structures of these swellings or uh, cysts now biopsy on the other hand will give a more uh, more applicable to solid swellings gives us total picture of the histopathical uh, pathological nature of that particular swelling thereby giving a confirmatory diagnosis or a, a last end uh, investigative uh, methods to give a confirmatory diagnosis for any kind of salivary gland uh, disease now the most important of uh, among these investigations uh, used in a routine basis is a silography now what is a silography now silography is nothing but introduction of a soluble kind of contrast imaging which can show radio opaque and radio uh, lucent areas within the salivary glands and then following it up with a sequential uh, radiographs to see the normal functioning or a normal development or a, uh, it could be functional imaging or it could be a standard a static imaging which can show either developmental disorders or functional disorders of the salivary glands and subsequently it can uh, uh, help us in the treatment planning 
Now the indications as I said because it can clearly show uh, radio opaque and radio lucent areas because it shows both the functional as well as developmental disorders. It can uh, detect a variety of disorders starting from developmental such as your calculus or cellulose or aberrant uh, salivary glands or atresia or, or hypoplasia of salivary glands to uh, induce kind of etiologies uh, which uh, functional kind of disorders like uh, tumors or uh, infections or uh, uh, any irreversible uh, ductal damage because of any autoimmune disorders. So this kind of investigative method is uh, very useful in the sense that it can uh, uh, detect uh, pin or pinpoint any kind of functional or developmental disorders. Now the contraindications, uh, since the process involves uh, uh, injection of an soluble iodine uh, isotope or an uh, I iodine uh, isotope since it is uh, taken up by the uh, salivary glands. So any uh, uh, allergies to uh, iodine, uh, these kind of patients, uh, this kind of a method is uh, not used, it is contraindicated. Also in acute inf infections, when there is a disturbance of the uh, structure or the function of the salivary glands, this uh, kind of uh, salivary gives a wrong picture and it can uh, aggravate the acute infections of salivary glands also. And also in thyroid disorders, uh, basically because we are using an uh, iodine radioisotope, it is contraindicated. Now, uh, the contrast media which is used are uh, basically are in, uh, iodine uh, radioisotopes. Now, the ideal requisites over here is uh, obvious uh, for obvious reasons. It should be non-toxic. Now, uh, it should be miscible with the saliva since the normal function, uh, it has to reproduce or uh, replicate the function or the normal function of the saliva. So it has to be totally miscible with saliva. Now it has to have the similar properties of a saliva since it has to again replicate the function of salivary glands. Now low surface tension, why? Because it can be easily flushed out from the system. Now low viscosity, primarily because during the injection of contrast media within the salivary glands, because of the low viscosity, the ease of injection would be much more easier. Now that would, uh, that would also mean that there is less pain uh, during the introduction of contrast media within the uh, salivary glands uh, ducts or the salivary glands itself. Now in, instead if we have a high viscosity or an oil uh, based uh, contrast media or an immersion based uh, contrast media, it would be highly painful since the pressure required to push the oil based uh, contrast media within the salivary glands would be higher thereby causing much more discomfort to the patient. Now these are all the normal appearances of uh, the salivary gland uh, disorders or uh, usage of salivary glands as you can see in the this particular picture you can see how it has revealed the calculus in the submandibular gland duct now you can see the normal appearance of the submandibular uh, glands again you can see the uh, production or uh, image on a cross section of submandibular uh, radiography which shows clearly the calculus or the law, law, big calculus in the salivary, uh, some bandula uh, gland ducts. Similarly, again, which shows the submandibular gland duct, which is a normal appearance for the uh, submandibular gland and its uh, ducts. Now, the interpretation of these, uh, these are the normal appearances of uh, salivary uh, pictures. The parotid gland, because it's much more wider in the lateral surface on a lateral uh, radiographies. Uh, we can uh, always see this kind of picture which is uh, classically uh, termed as tree in winter appearance that is uh, a typical or a normal appearance of the parotid gland. Now uh, since the submandible gland is much more shorter and wider it looks like a bush in winter appearance with, uh, with, uh, uh, with only the branches. Now that would be the appearance of the submandibular gland ducts. Now in these pathological appearances, we can see the calculi. Now the, because of the calculus, which is uh, seen in the uh, gland uh, ducts, you can see the constriction of this particular area, in this particular area wherein the calculus is present and the enlargement of the salivary gland ducts before and after that particular region. They were uh, indicating the physician that there is some kind of obstruction uh, because a uh, uh, pathological or inherent uh, uh, obstruction of the uh, gland ducts over there, they were uh, needing uh, further uh, medical intervention. 
Now, sideroidocitis, that is nothing but uh, the inflammation and uh, of the salivary gland ducts over the, in a sausage-like appearance. As you can see, there are long strictures, uh, which again uh, gives rise to a classic stricture and enlargement with subsequent strictures and enlargement, thereby giving a sausage-like appearance that you can see in this particular area. Now we have silent editors, we have blobs of contrast media within the gland, which is salactasis, basically because of the uh, destruction of the parenchyma cells, we can see extravasation of the contrast media outside the salivary gland ducts or the outside the parenchyma cells. Thereby we can see blobs of contrast media within the salivary gland parenchyma, the main salivary gland itself. Now in Jogren's syndrome, as I said, because of the autoimmune inflammatory disease, there is total destruction of the parenchyma cells. We can see snowstorm or branches, fruit laden tree appearance. That is primarily because these blobs of uh, contrast media have uh, exuded out from the par uh, damaged uh, parenchymal cells outside the uh, SNIs and thereby it causes a snowstorm appearance. Now, as I said, there's a, there are a few contraindications for uh, silography, like in uh, allergies to iodine uh, itself, or thyroid disorders, or presence of acute infections. To, so, to overcome these uh, contraindications, uh, we have come up with uh, something called as radioisotope uh, imaging, where radioisotopes or iodine 131 is used for uh, as a contrast media. So, basically, it has been uh, introduced to overcome the contraindications of uh, silography. And uh, that would be the uh, basic usage of uh, it or uh, usage of indications of radioisotope imaging. But this also comes with its own package of disadvantages. There is absolutely high radiation dose, primarily because of the radioisotopes which we are using. It is not disease specific. Now uh, it may, it shows all kinds of diseases with the same uh, kind of uh, uh, radiographic picture or a, on a, or a scan picture. And there's uh, absolutely no indication of the gland anatomy since this is not a functional kind of imaging. That uh, brings us to the end of salivary gland disorders and the imagings, uh, especially salivographies, which are useful for the clinical physicians to uh, uh, enhance their treatment plan and give a proper treatment plan to the uh, patient. Thank you.